Our next presenter is from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Little Devices Lab. We talk about DIY medical technologies and the Maker Nurse Project that has been demonstrated here this week at uh, Mayo Clinic, Jose Gomez Marquez. Thank you. Good morning. When you look at a bicycle, when you ride it, when you see somebody on it, um, it's all there. It's, it's this transparent design that hides nothing. You can understand exactly how it works. And it's that invitation to, to modify, to, to, to participate in the design process that really, if you think about it, allows people to um, add, uh, my clicker's not working. Oh, there we go. You know, I don't know how many of you did this when you were a little kid. Uh, add noisemakers. Um, we can add training wheels. We can add lights. We can add motors, babies, <laughs> flowers. It's, it's, it's this really open design that, that was in that same sensibility when the Wright brothers um, created their flyer. It's one of those astonishing pieces of technology that when you look at it, again, it's all there. And that began a whole aviation industry of lots of people that got inspired by uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright and gave us the aerospace industry we have today. When we look at medical technology, it's anything but transparent. It's really cloaked in obscurity. It's designed with complexity of engineering and, and sometimes a subtleness of design that really doesn't invite um, modification by anybody. It's, it's, sometimes I call it the, if anybody saw a Lego movie, it, it's the craggled version of a technology. <laughs> Engineers call it design lock. I call it design for black box. And it's not the black boxes that you find in airplanes. It's, it's this notion that um, regardless of how we push um, the latest advances in medical technology, the last thing we do, even though we talk about user-centered design, the last thing we do is actually invite people to, to, to modify, hack them, and, and, and make them their own in the same way that the Wright brothers had the foresight um, to, to, to design, given that they were, in fact, bike designers. Um, when somebody like Nick uses a pull socks uh, to, to check on their COPD or pneumonia. Um, he doesn't understand how it works. He just takes it for granted, presses a button, and that's basically our relationship with medical technology. He doesn't understand that even though um, there are more than 25 parts in this device, it only actually takes about three to get the job done. When somebody takes a pregnancy test and picks up the digital one that costs $20, at the local pharmacy, they don't understand that even though there, it, there are more than 35 parts, at the end of the day, you can actually get the job done with only two, which is what the biology that runs it. But we feel good about buying the more expensive one, even though we don't really understand why it's better, just because it has a button. Why is this important? Why, why would we care? about people not only understanding how medical technology is made and inviting them to modify it. Well, the reality is that the history of medicine is filled with people that didn't give in to the black box, that decided to go above and beyond and hack it and not take the black box for granted. Um, people like, um, this is Dr. John Haitian Gibbons, who in the early 1940s and 50s designed the heart and lung machine, and what few people know is that he actually started to give away the blueprint so other doctors could replicate the machine and help their patients. A device that we use every day uh, in heart surgeries around the country. People like Andreas Grunzig in Switzerland, an interventional radiologist who saw that people were using balloon catheters to treat peripheral veins in, in, your, in your legs, and he wanted to use it in the heart, but he was simply, even though he had a, a country that had means, great engineering schools, 
He was simply outside the game, and so he would come home from 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. in the morning and effectively hack with his neighbors and make prototypes on the kitchen counter. And you can see, there's the pizza magnets in the back. And out of that came what we know as the balloon catheter for, an for, for, for angioplasty surgeries. It changed medicine as we know it. Three million people a year use these types of devices. He presented his work at, uh, in the United States, and Emory scooped him up, and we got a whole field from a medical maker. And a recent example that I came across was the work of a graphic designer in 1968 working at a, pharma uh, at a uh, chemical pharmaceutical company, walked into the lab with an acrylic paper clip holder, the ones that have the little magnets, and decided to modify it. And out came the first pregnancy test that you can use at home. And Margaret Crane didn't, didn't seek out to think about how she could invent a new medical device when she probably took that job. But again, there were subtle notions in the underlying technology that made it so transparent enough for her to actually push this. But since the days of Margaret, the reality is the world has changed. The, industry, the, the medical industrial complex has changed. And design for black box is the norm in medical technologies that our patients use. And we want to we want to bring back the medical makers and the people that at the end are at the front lines of care. Somebody recently told me they're faster than an engineering firm and closer to the patient than a medical device firm. So through projects like Maker Nurse, Maker Health, and our own work at the lab, what we seek to do is not generate the next device that's a cool device. We try to generate the democratized device that seeks transparent design that anybody can make. We heard from John Kostick yesterday, the Night Scout project. This is a typical maker, medical maker project. But you may not have met Daniela Urbina. Daniela was a nurse in Esteli, Nicaragua, about the center, in the center of the country near the Coffee Highlands, and her stethoscope broke. And when I met her, um, they had told me, you know, she, she fixed her stethoscope. Um, and what she did is the little diaphragm that vibrates back and forth, that it basically is a reverse speaker that allows you to listen to your heart sounds, um, broke. And not having the means to buy a new one or the supply chain to procure one, what she did is she went around the hospital and experimented with different types of plastics and cut them in, cut them in small circles. And she tried Dixie cups, she tried plate, paper plates, and she settled on overhead transparency slides and you, that, that were used for, for lessons at the medical school in that, in that, in that hospital. And you can kind of still see the red smudges of the Sharpies. And it worked for her. The tragedy was that it took me about two hours for her to show me her prototype because she was fundamentally embarrassed to show a prototype to some engineer from MIT. What she didn't know is that she was at MIT, we would have probably given her an auditorium to tell us and walk us through her hack. Because at the end of the day, she was actually the one saving lives with her device. We were just having fun with 3D printers and that sort of thing. This was our first maker nurse. And three years ago, we got a call from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and said, what could you do in America? Could you find more Danielas and how do we do it? And 70,000 miles later, in planes, trains, and automobiles, we crisscrossed the country, effectively trying to find Daniela Urbinas, these maker nurses that are working underground, almost in a stealth innovation manner, through networks of technology transfer that we are still having a hard time understanding, that are changing the, 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 the face of medicine by inventing everyday things that are helping our patients. They're hacking IV tubes. They're modifying the way call buttons are made. They're creating homemade devices when they have to visit patients in their, own, in their own house, when they don't have a hospital supply closet. Even though the FDA approved about 120 devices last year, they're creating thousands of them. And what we want to do is bring them back up to surface. Because for about 100 years, they've been operated in, in the shadows. People like Victor Tai in Brooklyn, New York, who makes Lego models for oncology patients that are cognitively impaired, 
little kids that have no idea what this massive death ray thing is look, that's pointing at them looks like. So he, he makes these, these tiny little models and hacks other Lego clays so people can understand. People like Roxana Reina, um, oh, in the lower right, who modifies wound dressing bandages to treat neonates with emphalocils and transforms that into simple wound dressing procedure as opposed to an invasive surgery that has to be done within days of, of being born, saving her hospital almost a million dollars a year. Roxana met President Obama last year as part of the White House Honored Makers program in their Maker Fair. And we were thrilled because it was one small step in getting a recognition for a lot of these nurses that are working in the shadows that for years have been told, you have to look at the evidence, but you cannot look at the experiment. You can't think about creating a hypothesis without making sure that a hypothesis is already proven. And they end up checking what engineers and doctors create. And it's simply about homework checking as opposed to creating the next big thing. And we're out there to tell them it's okay to create the new thing. It's okay if you don't find evidence because of course if it's new, it's not gonna be around. So that they don't do just the latter end of the pipeline of evidence, but the beginning of it, the creation of these things that then have to be evaluated. And the way we're doing that is providing tools. After understanding and researching them for two years, understanding what their drivers are, what their personalities are, what type of materials they use, it's not about just shipping a bunch of 3D printers to all hospitals. Um, it's about understanding that a 3D printer is not going to do anything for an IV line, for instance, or for a, or a wound vac. And so what we're creating is these medical maker spaces embedded in hospitals where you press the eight on the elevator and you see your patient and if you need something and if you see a problem that nobody makes, you hit number nine and then you can go and make it. It has a curated medical materials library, it has sensors, it has digital fabrication tools, and it has different facilitators that are not gonna make it for you, but they're going to show you how you can make it so that we can accelerate this technology transfer process. Because what we find is when people make it themselves, economists have studied this, they adopt things faster. Last week in Galveston, Texas, this nurse in one of our medical makerspaces, his name is Jason, um, went in on a regular Monday morning, got tired of standing seven hours after a burn patient would walk into his burn unit so that essentially they have to stand about seven hours showering that patient with sterilized water to make sure there's no infection in there, all the debris gets, gets, gets run away. He went in, he used a 3D printer, he used some assembly tools, and in about three days, he made this rig that has three different medical shower heads so that nurses don't have to stand as a, as, a, as a tripod and instead can do the other things that they were actually trained to do. Jason is now a mini celebrity in Texas um, and we're thrilled for it because the idea, it's not so much about the things that we can make in the lab, again, it's about the kick that we get is how can we generate the tools so that there's more Jasons and Roxanas and, Vi and Victors and the next Andreas Grunzigs so that they can again continue to reinvent the way we, we care for our patients. In the case of Jason, he hits on us something specific. The reality is there's not a lot of burn centers in the, in the, that, that, that have the same capabilities as Jason. For somebody to make the device that Jason make, they would have to have a sufficiently big enough market to make it affordable for people to actually have these in hospitals. And if there isn't a big enough market, then the traditional equation in healthcare is, then let's charge $25,000 per shower head um, and actually make a sustainable model. But this is where medical making actually is really useful. It's uniquely positioned to cater to these end of one problems because you don't have to sell it, you don't have to transact on it, you don't have to create a sustainable, you can just make it and if it's based on a transparent notion that anybody can make it, then we can actually um, diffuse it. We're working with places like Thomas Jefferson University and Dr. Bon Koo up in the upper left-hand corner. And thinking about what is it gonna be like when doctors inside a hospital think about not just prescribing a pill, but perhaps a prototype, and we call this design for discharge. And he mentioned this a little bit yesterday. The idea here was, 
what if we could change the adherence models for, 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 for patients, not by looking at the next gadget that's $300 or, 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 or you know, the internet of medical things, but we're creating one for about $20 with the patient on the way out of the ER. One of the things that, that keeps us up at night um, and why we do this, uh, in addition to trying to democratize this notion of medical fabrication so that we can get more lead users, is that what we're noticing is that as we get excited about digital medicine, and digital health and apps and all these new technologies coming out of Silicon Valley, you know, places like Rochester and Minneapolis and Boston, is that we have a lot of cool gadgets that are coming out. But when we attach a smartphone, you know, there's so many promises of generating data and doing smart things with that data. But when we take the long view, and when I do a comparison shopping, we end up with things like the $2 thermometer that you can buy at CVS. When you plug in a smartphone, it's a $30 thermometer. You know? Same thing for the blood pressure cuff. Same thing for a baby thermometer, same thing for the pill bottles. It's unlike any other technology that's become a smartphone-enabled um, app. You know, we don't buy Rolodexes anymore. We use an icon that's free on our phone. Why is it that medicine is going the wrong way in digital health in terms of equity and access? The way we attack this problem is not trying to make the Kia of these types of devices. We try to basically diffuse it in the same way that John Kostick diffused his amazing technology for, to, to more than you know, 2,000 people and created a fan base of 14,000. And when they went to the FDA, they were like, we have a Facebook group. <laughs> that way, when we talk about the quantified self, about the promise of how we're going to enable wellness and health and engagement, we're not just talking about a select few. We're talking about a much bigger tent. One of the ways we approach this is we create kits. We really like kits. We think they lower the prototyping barriers to a lot of people. You know, you find kits for electronics, you find kits for beer making, for bicycle repair. The first Apple computer was actually st shipped as a kit. The steam engine was originally shipped as a kit. And what it allows you to do is put it together in different ways, not just this one linear equation. And so what we make, we actually make kits for medical devices. Um, and over the last year, we actually applied about five years' worth of research to making a class with Lee Gerke, Grace Teo, and Anna Young at MIT, um, where we told our MIT students, we're going to make a device that generates patient data, but we're not going to just make the black box device that then, I, then you give me. If you give me a final device, I will fail you. Instead, what you're going to give us is a kit that anybody can then recreate that device. And you're actually going to be graded in how many ways people can modify that device. So that when we generate the data, not only are they generating something that they created, they, they're generating data that they own. We call this notion design for hack. The notion that, for us, success in technology transfer is the moment somebody then takes your technology, in case of our technology, and modifies it in ways that we would have never expected. Because then I know that it's really their device. And it's going to live its own life. And so these are some of the technologies and devices that, that, that the patients, that the, that the students made. Um, they generated some data. Up in the upper left-hand corner um, is an ortho orthotic device for pediatrics, um, which tracks when people fall so that we know if they're fitting well. Up in the lower right-hand corner is um, a dog leash that we sensorize so that we can test how MS patients are doing um, as, their, as their muscle um, uh, strength increases and decreases. And lastly, of course, air, if you turned on the news in October, Ebola was hitting us like a wildfire. And it was a disease that it was basically Hollywood's worst script come to life. Um, you know, people were checking fevers. Ironically, that smartphone thermometer was nowhere to be seen. Um, and the United States and the Western world deployed one of the largest shipments of medical black boxes we've ever seen. 
One company got about $247 million in a contract with little to show for. And we kept seeing diagnostics left and right that were being sold for $20 when in the lab we could scratch our heads and realize this is definitely not $20. So with our colleagues, we generated this device, which is the MMDX, and it can test for Ebola, dengue, yellow fever, and multiple other types of viruses at the same time with just a single drop of blood. But we went above and beyond. We said, instead of just giving them a device, which would be, in a sense, a black box, even if it's a simple black box, why don't we try to generate something that they can use locally? So we started the Open Diagnostics Initiative, which is essentially a biological API that anybody can use. And what we do is we're sending construction kits for these devices in West Africa, because the reality is they're going to be much faster to look at a Ebola patient than we will ever look at. And that way, again, it becomes their device. And my hope is that as this new generation comes up, this can be the generation that recognizes that medicine is not a black box. And then great medicine starts with great tinkering, and that's the only thing they've ever known. Thank you.